effects, um, which is inapplicable when you're actually using uh, your finger. But let me click this. And now we're getting the sliding effect. Right? I can click slides, and it's actually going to pull up the PDF, which would render then in the phone or the simulator in that case. And if I go back, you know, it's pretty good about sliding, but it feels like it just slid in the wrong direction. Um, when I click back, I still see the address bar up top, and I would in the simulator. You can hide the address bar. Um, some sites do this, whereby if you pull up the mobile website, um, you don't see the address bar by default. And that's really because of a JavaScript hack, whereby if you're familiar with the notion of the scroll top property of a page, which says, where should the scroll bar start? What a lot of websites do is they just, with JavaScript, say, move the scroll bar 20 pixels, and there's your hidden address bar. Um, but it's still actually there. Yeah? Uh, say that once more. Why doesn't the, uh, that feature rely on like, a schema pass validation rather than on the data that, um, attribute? Well, OK, so why not use an XML schema or DTD to actually validate the HTML markup? Um, the short of it is that browsers want to on browsers only care about adherence, in theory, to a minimal set of standards. The data hyphen roles are meant to be unique to any old website. Um, you could require that individual websites produce a DTD or schema or RelaxNG schema for their HTML. But I think the world just doesn't care enough to actually do that. I mean, I think that you could. You absolutely could. That would be a much more rigorous design. But I mean, we live in a world where they don't even require us to close some of our tags. Um, and so that's kind of the mindset, I think, in general. Other questions? All right, so better, and if you're making a mobile website, and such as the one I demoed last week, the CS50 Fair mobile website, we did that little trick where we moved the scroll bar up so you didn't actually see the address bar by default. And it's better than having to roll all of those features yourself with CSS and JavaScript. Um, so it's a way of getting started typically quite quickly. So the little tour there of frameworks. All right, so what about tools? So version control. So this is something we kind of sort of use in 50. In higher level classes, hopefully you've made um, more frequent use of this. And for this class, you will necessarily have to use version control. Specifically, for standardization's sake, we'll use Git for the class, um, which um, alongside Mercurial and Mm, Subversion is kind of on its way out, or really among the top contenders these days. Um, they're pretty much uh, Git. Um, Mercurial, Bazaar is another one. These are known as distributed version control systems, which are a leap beyond things like SVN, CVS, and older ones. Long story short, if you've ever used SVN or similar, these typically rely on a central repository. So you and your partner and your other colleagues all have uh, local copies of some website or some program. And when you want to share that code or save that code for perpetuity to the central server, you quote unquote push it to or commit it to a, a remote server. Um, the downside here is that as you're making local changes on your own laptop or desktop, um, if you're using something like SVN, you can push to the remote server, but you can't maintain versions in the same way in your local directory. So thus were born distributed version control systems like Git and Mercurial and others that allow you to not only uh, commit your code, save different versions, differentials, as often as you would like in your own local directory. They also then let you push to a similarly designed central server. But you can also pull directly from your colleagues and such. So particularly in large organizations where it's not just you and a partner, it's you and 10 people, you and 500 people, you can actually share collaboratively and merge other people's code, source code files, into your own work, give them your work. And so this is where things are going. So just to paint a picture of this, and we'll spend more time on this in labs, um, there's a few pieces of jargon that uh, underlie most of these systems. If you think of this as a timeline going from top to bottom, on the right-hand side there we'll call the master branch. The master branch is the product that you care about. And every one of those little blue circles represents an interesting commit where you rolled out some feature and pushed it into the central server. But along the way, you might want to experiment or different people might want to work on different things. And it's kind of a bad thing if everyone's working on the master branch because if one person has a bug, commits that bug to that central branch, who does it affect? Absolutely everyone. So the idea of these systems is that you can quote unquote branch off of the main branch and have your own little branches depicted here as little uh, yellow dots along this line that let you work on individual features and only merge back from left to right into the master branch when you have rigorously tested your code, it's been reviewed by some number of colleagues, and you're sure that you're not going to break 
the entire website. So um, companies like Facebook and others that are actually constantly pushing out changes to the website um, do engage in processes like this, where you work on your, own, on your own branch, and you only are allowed to merge it into the master branch once you know it's not going to take down all of Facebook. That's at least the theory of it. But I'm sure all of you have tripped over bugs in Facebook and the like, nonetheless. All right, um, if you really want to um, uh, wrap your mind around this, get sophisticated over time. And when there's more than just you and a friend, you can divvy things up as this uh, tutorial here has. We'll post this link online um, on the slides. But you can uh, traverse a tree that is your source code repository. So what does this mean in real terms? Well, what it means, when you first sit down to do a project for the class, um, working with your partner, um, both of you, or well, at least one of you initially, will create an empty directory, maybe start writing some code. But the moment you're ready to share that code or commit it to some central server, you're going to run a command like git init for initialize this directory. What does that do? It stores an invisible directory called .git in your current directory that where a lot of metadata is stored. All of the differentials between files that you've saved. You can then add files to that repository. You can commit, which means save files to that repository. You can push files from your repository to a remote server. Conversely, you can clone the repository in 50 this past year. Some of you might have used the clone command to download lecture examples or PSET distribution code. And you can also pull from another uh, friend, which means don't make a copy of it. It means integrate everything into your own code. So for the course, there's a bunch of options out there. Um, we've decided to use Bitbucket um, because, one, it's free. And two, because they give you unlimited private repositories. So you might, uh, the biggest player out there is GitHub, um, which charges a fortune to actually have a non-trivial number of private repositories. Private just means only you and people you authorize can access your code. GitHub is meant to be more social. So if you've heard of this company, um, they're wonderfully popular, especially for open source projects. But by default, all of your code is open, which means when you push to the central server, it means the whole world can then pull or clone it um, themselves. Not ideal for a class, not ideal when you're collaborating on something of your own design. Bitbucket, though, is similarly free. Um, it's because they want you to buy their non-free products, presumably. But they provide you with unlimited uh, code repositories, so private repositories. So the first project spec will walk you through the process of setting this up. But what this is going to mean is both you and your partner will have one of these repositories. One of you will set up the project initially, and then you'll be able to collaborate with each other by way of committing code to the central server. Um, the staff um, and in the future classmates can actually see your code and actually um, browse it on this website as well. They have nice little wiki and uh, bug tracking uh, features of it. So in short, we'll use a real world um, source code repository so that your experience is as real world as possible. Yeah. For the course, yes. You, you can use, in theory, other uh, repositories, but it's going to have to eventually get pushed into this, which is fine, because the whole idea behind Git is that you can actually push to multiple repositories, if you would like. All right. Um, that was a lot. Let's take a five-minute break. All right, so we are back. So a word on the first project. We'll touch base on this at the very end of today. The specification will go online tomorrow. And so that we realize folks have enough time to make sure they have a partner and such, um, we'll actually have the proposal due this Friday instead of this Wednesday. So website and syllabus and on online have been updated. The proposals are fairly low key. For the staff assigned projects, the proposal will really boil down to reading the spec um, and thinking about it and having a brief conversation with your partner about who is going to do what, figuring out, oh, I'll do the JavaScript. I'll do the PHP, or I'll do the database schema, or also um, just fig navigating those kinds of issues. For the student's choice projects, the proposal will be more like a traditional proposal where you have to get together, talk, and figure out what it is you are going to do. Um, so this is a typical release cycle. It fluctuates a little bit because of vacations and whatnot during the term. But next week, uh, for the design document and style guide, you'll be expected, using your Bitbucket accounts, to actually put together both a style guide for this first project and a design doc. Um, what does that mean? So a style guide will be akin to what we show in CS50, where you make some decisions, maybe arbitrary decisions, as to what your indentation is going to look like, what, uh, where you're going to put spaces. All of the things that we put into the style category in CS50, you're going to have to argue about and have some really stupid uh, arguments with your partner as to which is better, two spaces or four spaces, or tabs, or putting the curly brace on the same line or different line. We don't care what the outcome is, so long as your code ultimately is uniform. And so among the things we'll be looking for is adherence to your own set of standards. So that's always a fun religious conversation to have. The design document 
is the more intellectually stimulating part of that um, conversation you'll need to have. And typically, this will involve figuring out what are your database tables, if applicable, going to have to be. How you're going to normalize the tables and put IDs in one field, foreign keys in another, and the like.、Um, how are you going to go about designing the PHP code andor JavaScript, really fleshing out in detail in advance how you're going to approach the project so that ideally, after that Monday, you and your partner can go off autonomously, pretty much build some things independently, having made Promises to one another as to what you'll build and how you will interface with one another. So, we'll talk this today and Monday and beyond on how to sort of formulate those kinds of conversations. And the idea is that hopefully they will get easier and、uh, better over time.、Um, if come this weekend you sort of are standing at a chalkboard or hanging out with your partner and you're like, where do we even begin? Like, that's the perfect place to begin a design conversation.、Um, and I promise you, by Monday, you will have figured it all out. So,、um, thereafter, Will be do a beta version of the product by that Friday. Thereafter, will be an opportunity for the staff and classmates to review your code and actually comment on it. And then finally, a couple weeks after this whole process, a formal release date where you ship that code. And it will look amazing at that point. All right. So, object oriented programming. This is something that、uh, comes up in CS51 and in some other higher level classes. For those who have less experience with